overhead kick. And what a goal it was! Stewart makes it 1 1. And it is a gorgeous little chip. This could well be the moment. Yeah. It is the moment! Hello and welcome to Kickoff, the official podcast of NPL New South Wales and Football New South Wales League competitions. My name's Teo Pelizzeri, joined by my co-host Henley Warner. Teo, how are you going today? Hey, it's <laughs> nice to be around with the sun up. I've finished uh, a month of working on the Euros uh, and I've been out and about reacquainting myself with, with daytime, which is nice. Um how about you, Henley? How's the last month or so treated you? Being great. I've just got back from India, actually. So that was a nice little two weeks, but I'm back in the action of our NPL comp and I could not be happier, to be honest. We've got a great show coming up. We've got lots of guests and also we'll talk about all the issues that are facing the league uh, as we get to the business end of the season. I know that it's been a, you've been away, but uh, it's been a pretty rainy, uh, difficult winter for some of our clubs, Henley. But thankfully not cold. Yes. I spent I spent a few days down in Melbourne, uh, and I, it's just a reminder that even even though it might be raining quite a bit and it's windy sometimes, at least it's not cold here in in NPL New South Wales yep, on absolutely. your weekends. Now we've got lots going on around NPL, the NPL environment, our cup competitions as well, which of course a lot of the NPL teams compete in. So tell us what's on the calendar that people can look forward to in the very short term. Alrighty, well, first off the rank, we have the Australia Cup round of 32 coming up. So we have Apia Leichhardt, Blacktown City, we've got NWS Spirit and Rockdale. I'm very excited to say I will be at... Blacktown City versus Adelaide United, commentating that one for uh, Paramount, and the NWS Spirit versus Glenorchy game. Now, that is at Spirit's home ground at Christie Park. So everyone get down there and support them. I think (laughs) we might have... uh, I might be the only person there not wearing a little koala insignia (laughs) on my spray jacket because I suspect they are going to pack the place out with juniors, Mm -hmm. and I think they could have a very parochial crowd for that one. But also... Blacktown City uh, at home on the synthetic against an A-League team first game in preseason. Uh, I've circled that one as a big upset special. But I'm excited for it though, aren't you? I mean, I think Blacktown's got a really strong team this year. Even if we look at our NPL comp with how they've been performing, I cannot wait for this fixture. I think Rockdale's a red hot chance against Newcastle as well. Do you really? Well, I mean, I know they've got the league to think about and you know, balancing league and cup, but I've, I've been told from a pretty good source that they're not going to just you know, go say la vie with the cup and, you know, focus on the league. They want to win and they want as they want as much as possible. So uh, sometimes teams can get distracted, you know, they're battling relegation like we saw with Mount Druitt last season or they've got circumstances around their league fixtures where the league's the priority. Nah, Rockdale want the lot. So that, that's pretty exciting to look forward to. I think we could have two NPL New South Wales teams potentially knocking off A-League teams in this round of 32. Is that your hot take? For this. I don't think it's even that hot. I think <laughs> by the time by the time the games happen, it, you know, it, it may have looked uh, it may have looked cap, captain obvious in hindsight. Uh, now, speaking of cups, there's more there's more cup action on the way. Yes, we have got Rockdale Illidan making the Waratah Cup final, and at the time production, the second semi will be played on Wednesday between Bucktown City and Apia. So everyone, get down, support your team, whether you're in the maroon and blue or you're in the black and red. Get down and give all the boys a love and support. Who do you reckon? We're on the topic of hot takes. Come on, who do you think's got this one? Uh, n- I think uh, I think RPN oh. need it. Mm. I think they need it. Yeah. So, but again, Blacktown City they want the lot, you know. And the Waratah, I think the Waratah Cup, I, I do think that it is being held in as high esteem as it's ever been, which is really valuable and important at this level of football. But also, I think RP need it after the upset result last year mm. against United. You know, I think they're coming back for revenge if they win this into the finals. Definitely. Now, on the subject of Cups, we also have the Sapphire Cup semifinals. NWS Spirit against the Northern Tigers and Sydney University versus Sydney Olympics. So uh, teams that have been at or near the pointy end historically. I know that Sydney Olympics having a very good season, probably got their eyes on a double. And, uh, you know, Tigers have been in grand finals. Sydney Uni historically have had great success in the late 2010s and early 2020s. I don't know, a bit of a coin flip for both. Uh, I'm not, you know, Spirit's probably the underdog out of the four of those teams, but I, I'm really, I'm, I'm at a bit of a loss as to 
who I think is the clear favourite. Maybe it's Sydney Olympic Henley, but I think that speaks to how competitive and close NPL women's has been this season, that we have a, a genuinely even final four in, in the Cup. And sad to say that we didn't get a, a fairy tale run from outside the top division. I remember on the season preview podcast, we were discussing, oh, could there be a surprise team come from uh, League One or one of the other divisions? But we still have two, four very good clubs that have found their way to this penultimate round. Yeah, absolutely. And on the topic of, you know, closeness of teams and, you know, the standard, we've also got quite an exciting few next rounds coming up in both the NPL men's and women's top six relegation spots, particularly in the men's. If we have a look down the bottom, there's about two points between 12th and 16th. So I think that's going to be a really exciting relegation battle between, you know, those, what, five or so clubs there with the women's as well. Um, up here currently leading the way, but only just you've still got Illawarra and Sydney Olympic to play a few games. So I think everyone needs to just hold on tight because I think it's going to get even more spicy as the next few rounds unfold. That's looking at what's coming up. Let's take a moment to look back, Henley, with our moment of the month. Now, I'm going to cheat just a little bit okay. <laughs> for NPL men's because it's more NPL boys. And the New South Wales Metro team did end up winning the Under-16 National Youth Championship down in Wollongong with a team filled with players primarily from Western Sydney Wanderers and Sydney FC, but a sprinkling of other players across NPL clubs uh, that aren't in the A-League academies just yet. Uh, New South Wales sent a number of different teams and ended up beating Queensland in the final of the Under-16s. They got knocked out in the semi-finals of the under-15 boys, uh, but also they had other teams that had made quarterfinals, competed in the group stage. Very entertaining tournament. Obviously, it's a a really competitive age group, 15 and 16-year-olds. You're trying to break into the Australian under-17 national team for the first time, and I'm sure that'll be reflected in the selection with a lot of the boys the next time the Joeys play. Uh, Congratulations to Spencer Pryor and Pete Novikovsky, who works here at Football New South Wales, one of his uh, coaching staff, They ended up as the national champions in the under-16s, beating Queensland 2-1 in the final. Well, on the topic of young talent, um, my moment of the month actually has to do with our Liberty A-League signings. In particular, a very special individual, Amber Lukmeyer, who has just signed for Sydney FC. Now, there are a myriad of girls that have been re-signed from our NPL New South Wales competition, such as Brianna Edwards has gone to Sydney FC. Ella Buchanan has re-signed for the Western Sydney Wanderers. And the Jets have re-signed the likes of Sophie Hoban, Claudia Chico, Emma Dundas. I think it really just speaks volumes about the talent and quality of players that we have in our NPL women's stream at Football New South Wales. Now, we were sitting right here in pre-season and I suggested that Amber Luchtmeyer could be one of the breakout players and score 10 goals this season. The time of recording, she scored 18. So she's on track for 20 plus. She's in a really competitive race for the golden boot. But perhaps one of the reasons that she's made this sort of massive leap uh, to get signed by Sydney FC is that the Golden Boot two seasons ago, Shea Connors won it with 12. Mm. And we already we already have about 10 players who've scored 12 or more. Now, I would say this season is a bit more of a normal season. Yeah. And two years ago was uncharacteristic to have a top scorer with such a low tally. But it just goes to show, you know, what a, a fantastic campaign she's had that you know, I tend to be quite guilty of talking players up. <laughs> and, she's, and she's still scored nearly double the number of goals I thought she could score this year. But it's not even like she's just quality. She's only 17 and we all know how much I love young talent. But like, I think she's incredible. And if we are not like keeping our eyes open, watching out for her, I think you'd you'd be silly not to. But that was my subtle way of saying we called it. Yeah, exactly. Who knows to us? Ahead of the the curve on on that one. But no, uh, I think um, you you can't lose sight of what's important in the moment. I mean, winning a trophy, being successful with Bulls Academy this season – right now, that's something you want to take with you and remember forever. You don't want to get too caught up in first A-League season, pre-seasons around the corner. They, Bulls want to win something this year. You know that That's what's important to them in the short term. And you know, the, the way it's currently stacking up, they've got a, the battle of a real struggle down the home stretch just to make the top six. Mm. So Amber's going to have to keep scoring if they, if they want to be there on grand final day like they were last season. Absolutely agree with you there. Now, I have a quick little moment of the month as well. I mentioned the boys' nationals, but since we last recorded Henley, we also had the girls' nationals. Now, these teams have... I would say a slightly more representative um, in senior NPL women's 
um, Amelia Casser, who was player of the tournament for New South Wales Metro, and, and they won that tournament quite convincingly, has appeared in Team of the Week in NPL New South Wales a number of times in the lead up to going away with that New South Wales Metro team. But uh, congratulations to them. I know that Football New South Wales Institute, their results often, you know, take a real hit around this time of the season when the nationals are on and they have to, you know, hand those players over and go and prepare for, you know, the challenge of six games in, in six days. But uh, as much as they're, you know, not flying this season, five wins out of 20, you know, the purpose of why they've been assembled to get players ID'd for national selection, you know, New South Wales under 16, under 15s won the tournament uh, in 15s from New South Wales Metro. The 16s scored 29 wow. and it did not concede for the entire tournament. That's so, incredible. Well, I think, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say, you know, split the teams in two or distribute the talent. I'd say they set a benchmark that the rest of the country's got to go and chase, not just because they were dominant, but because they let players express themselves. You know, I've, I've come away from that tournament with a number of names to think about into the future. And when I see them start to play a bit more for that first grade NPL team, I'll be very interested to see how they go against adults because against their peers, against fellow kids, they really did look unbelievable. Smashing it. So let's get into our guests and we'll start with NPL New South Wales men's on the other side of this short break. You're listening to Kickoff. Every NPL New South Wales match live, free and on demand on YouTube. Subscribe to the Football New South Wales YouTube channel today. So let's go to one of the most cutthroat battles, I, th I think anywhere in football in this country, any division, any league, it is the battle to avoid the drop out of NPL New South Wales men's. And one player that has a huge amount of responsibility in making sure that his club keeps their head above the parapet at the end of the season from Sutherland Sharks is Jay McGowan. Jay, thanks for jumping on and speaking to us on kickoff. Thank you very much for having me. Mate, uh, I know we're in the midwinter grind and we're starting to get towards the business end of the season. We've had a lot of wind, a lot of rain and a lot of bad weather, but... Uh, Sutherland, they are enjoying a form revival. Is it something about winter that has uh, led to this or is it simply the circumstances and the pressure of knowing that you face must-win games more often than not that's uh, helped your club, you know, keep your head above water in this relegation battle? Um, I think it's just solely dependent on how we've matured as a group because our team's quite young, so a lot of us are in our first years of first grade and there's a few boys that are still learning the ropes. So I think... As the season's gone on and as we've found our of play, we've really developed as a squad and, and matured in that sense. And we've actually been showing that in all our games, I think, especially in the second half of the season. So I think that plays a big role in terms of how we're playing. It It also definitely does help in to, towards the end of the season where the pressure does come in and we need to get these results. As far as, you know, what the boys discuss and the context of the latter. Are there some players who are particularly good at just taking it one game at a time? Are there others that, be it at training or be it in the rooms before a game, talk about the latter? Or do you have team rules around not trying to ramp up that level of pressure about the context and the circumstances of each game that you play? Yeah, I think the coaching staff have definitely done a great job in terms of just making sure we uh, work on week in, week out on what who our opponent is and just focus on that game instead of looking at it as a whole because you know that is definitely a, a big thing in terms of going into the games mindset wise um there's definitely great players and a lot of in our team especially like Nenad Verkish who've got a lot of experience in the NPL space and that definitely do help us young boys stay on track and focus week in week out on our performances now, there's been a bit of a roller coaster in terms of results with Sharks this season. However, over the last few weeks, you have really scored quite a number of goals. Tell us, how are you feeling about your own performance this season so far? Yeah, it's always great to start getting the goals coming in, but it's just full credit to the team, in fairness. Like, I can't do my job if our team's not doing their job at the back and getting our results that way. So it, it, do, it doesn't just rely on me. It's kind of like I get the ball just at the top and I kind of try and create finish the chances off for a team. That's about it. Uh, you sound very laid back about it, but, mate, I, I think perhaps best summed up by the goal against Barconi, which was spectacular, and you didn't have a celebration. You just turned around and said thanks to your teammates and sort of, you know, one finger in the air, no need for any greater celebration than that. Is that is that something that, uh, you know, you just take it in your stride or were you perhaps surprised in that moment about what a great strike it actually was? 
Um, I think a lot of it was kind of just the the time of the game. We were we were down one nil, and then we did get up to two one, but it just wasn't like the game wasn't over. So I, I think for me, mindset wise, it was like we keep going, and now we try and push for the result. And that game, Mo Armin scored a, a cracking goal as well. So I don't know if my goal was the best that one. Now, earlier you mentioned about, you know, coaching and leadership. You have a new coach for the Sharks for the 2024 season with Stephen Zorich. How has it been under his leadership this year? What What's he like as a coach? Yeah, he's a very disciplined and he's very, uh, he loves his, his touch, which is really good. And he does help us in terms of for the games and sending us different things. So you can tell that he's been experienced in the league and he knows how different teams run and different play styles. So it does help being that leader in front of you to guide you through the games. Is he the sort of coach that speaks one-to-one with specific individual instructions or is he very much the coach that speaks to the group uh, and that it's up to maybe the assistants uh, to speak to individual players or are you left to your own devices? What sort of instructions, if any, are you given specifically as an individual? He definitely addresses the team as a group in a lot in a lot of settings, but he does reach out individually and gives each an individual players their their tasks for the games and even trainings. So I think he is very good in terms of player management and doing those one on one conversations as well. Now on the topic again of like leadership um, and you know experience within the team, you have quite a number of older and experienced players as well on the squad. As much as you are like the squad's quite young, but one of which being Mitch Samatellis. Now, with him being club captain this year, how's that, you know, changed the team? What has it evolved under his leadership? What's it like with him as captain? He's just he's just a player that's just great to have because he can lead by example, by performances as well in terms of this guy's getting weak, team of the week each week. So he's just always so solid at the back end. He's just such a great guy as well. It's really make it easy for young players to go up to him and ask for advice or anything anything like that or any any sort of help on and off the football pitch so yeah it's a, it's a great example to have in your club you you've had a crack at a few clubs and you're still only young at 23 years of age so this is something of a you know a breakout season goals lots of minutes lots of starts but where's home i mean what was your your junior club and yeah, having had a crack at senior football to establish establish yourself in the NPL, is Sutherland home now, or do you do you still think of a different club as home? Uh, I, I definitely say Sutherland is one of my homes. I started my youth at Rockdale through up, up until about fifteen, so I was at Rockdale City Suns for quite a few years. Then I went to Sydney Olympic for a couple of years uh, to develop through the senior grade through 18s and 20s and then I moved to Sutherland and then also went to St George FC which was another big part of my career in terms of getting first grade minutes. What's the ambition? Is it to be a you know a league leading player? Do you do you hope that you can develop as a mature age player and see how far your football pushes you or is it the sort of thing that you you don't think too far ahead? I think for me I've always wanted to get to the highest level I can possibly and just work, work towards that. If, if that takes me to the professional game, that, that'd be great as well. But I think I'm trying to look at it as a season as is because that's, that's all you can do and try and perform the best I can in the environment I am in. And then hopefully, yeah. I can go higher and higher. Well, let, let's give you the chance to sell yourself because it's great. It's all well and good for us to look at your performances from the outside or for people to look at your numbers. But what characteristics or what traits in your game do you think have that potential to be unlocked at a professional level? Is there something about how you play or things you do on the field that you think if, if you got to test yourself at even the next level up, you'd be able to, to hang? I think my creativity and my brain, honestly is what kind of gets me past the line in terms of that front third. And, you know, when you, depending on who you play with, you have to adapt to your play style and, and things like that, where I feel like it's underappreciated in a lot of, in a lot of footballers. Cause these days you're looking at stats and that's all well and good, but there's a lot of things that happen off the ball and where the different movements and dragging plays out is, is just as important, but I think it just doesn't get seen as much. So, I think I can, I can um, pretty much 
have a lot of things to offer if I was to be in a high in an environment, but yeah. With the Sharks this year, you have a lot of exciting young talent, such as yourself, coming through. However, you also have some young guns like Mason Fernandez, Lachlan McDonald, that are also coming through the ranks. What is it like training alongside some of these younger boys, and how do you act as a leader for these players? Yeah, it's great having these young boys that are coming straight from academy as well, because you can tell they've got that technical ability and they've been in environments where they've been training for five days a week and they're developing because they're they're playing with older players, especially in the NPL space. I think when you're coming from an A-League setup, if you're training with A-League, then you're playing with men. But if you're in the NPL setup, you're essentially playing with good players, but they're all at the same age as you. So I think when you come into an NPL team, like for example, Sutherland or any other team, you have those older boys that have played in the league for 10 years plus. So they know how to play against men. And it's not just about the technical game that's always applied there's a lot of game management there's a bit of tips and tricks that you have to learn as you play in men's football and I think that's what I'm trying to convey to some of the players that are coming up and I think a few of the other older boys are trying to help them guide them through the men's football game. Now, just one more on the uh, the circumstances of the season before we uh, go through some rapid fire to finish because from 10th down, would still be feeling a little bit nervous. And 12th to 16th is currently separated by just two points in this relegation battle. And, and Sutherland's run home, Manly away, one of the teams that could still get dragged into it. Mariners on August the 3rd, which which is, you know, big red texture in the calendar as a big one to watch. And then Rockdale and the two St. George's to finish. So how are you feeling about that run home, but particularly that game against the Central Coast when they come down to Seymour Shore in uh, about 10 days' time from when we're recording? For myself, I just I, I find it exciting. I think as a lot of neutral spectators as well, it's but for myself, it's just another platform for my, myself to showcase my ability. And I think it's just like playing a grand final every week. And I think the boys are thriving off these challenges as well, looking at all these games as six-point games. And I think we're very keen on playing on these games. And, yeah, I, th- I think it's just very exciting for us. Well, we'll be keenly watching in this home stretch. But before we finish, uh, Jay, Henley is going to go through a bit of rapid fire. Just give us the first answer that comes to mind. Henley, take it away. All right. We have, first up, your first football memory. In the six at Oatley. Under six at Oatley. And the favourite foot- football player of all time? No. Day or night matches? Night. Best football you've ever played with? Tucker Hero Tagoa. Favourite post-game food indulgence? Pizza. <laughs> and the go-to karaoke song? Uh, any Bruno Mars song. Oh, okay. And the biggest football ick? Probably football boots with, like, no-show socks. Oh, gross. And last but not least, the NPL team you want to defeat most this season. Who's on that list? Looking at the latter, probably Andrew Coast. <laughs> good, good answer there. Jay, thanks so much for joining us. Congratulations on your form. And for Sutherland's sake, all the best maintaining it to that uh, finish line at the end of the season. Thank you very much. That's Jay McGowan joining us on kickoff. Stay with us. We're going to talk... A little bit of NPL Women's New South Wales after this short break. Day after day, Kappa rewrites the concept of sportswear. Kappa means teamwork, past, present, and future. Kappa never stops, because winning starts within. Two people, one brand. Kappa. It's time to talk NPL Women's New South Wales, and... After each podcast, Henley, Mm -hmm. I do get questions from people connected to one particular club saying, why does everyone treat us like it's their grand final? (laughs) When are you going to get our perspective? (laughs) Well, it's time for the Arpia perspective. It's time to get an Arpia player on. And we're going right to the top. We're going to the reigning golden uh, boot winner and NPL Women's Player of the Year from last season. And she remains a superstar of this competition. It's Ashley Crofts from Arpia Leichhardt. Ash, thanks for joining us. Hey guys, how are you going? Good. Now, do you feel as though when you play against opponents this year, they're playing their grand final or their cup final and everyone has put the target on up here this season? Uh, it seems that way, yeah. Based off um, you know, what people are saying, it 
seems that you know everyone's you know happy happy to beat us and wanting wanting to beat us but I guess um you know we we had a great season last year so we were kind of expecting that um and yeah we just kind of go in each week uh looking at ourselves um but yeah we are we are aware that people you know are um are wanting to beat us and we, we, we try and strive from that, so, yeah. With that said, you are top of the tree at the moment with a little break on the competition. You've only dropped the two league games for the season and all the numbers add up. You've got the third best attack. You've got uh, the equal second best defence. I mean, it, it must feel as though you are on track uh, to capture the, the trophies that the club really desires and to back up finishing top of the league last season. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, we had we had a rough start. Um, you know, when you coming off the season we had and you lo- lose the first two rounds of the season, um, you know, it was I'm not going to say it was panic stations, but it was a lot of you know everyone looking around, going what what's you know what's going on, what's what's gone wrong. But we've we've come together really well. We've worked really hard, you know, as a club and for each other. And um, yeah, we've just kind of got the got the machine moving along nicely. Um, and yeah, we just kind of, you know, want to just focus, focus on each week. Um, we know that, uh, you know, we are top at the moment, but it's such a tight competition. Um, every, every week you're playing teams and even results of other games, like you you never really know who's going to beat who. You've got to be on, on top of your game every week. Um, cause yeah, it is a really tight competition at the moment. Now, I want to talk to you about a game in particular. We had your 3-2 win over Bulls FC Academy a few weeks ago. Now, I was there at the game. I was getting a bit nervous for Apia. How were you guys feeling after that absolutely great comeback in the second half of that game? Yeah, I mean, we were we were really stoked. We were really, really happy with ourselves and just... You know, we, we never, we never, we, I mean, you know, two nils a bit scary, but we, you know, we never, never lost hope. We kept doing what we've been working on and trusting in the process um, and just believing in ourselves and our team. Um, you know, I've been in quite a few teams in a, in the space of my career and, um, you know, we're just such, you know, we're, there's no arguments amongst the team where all, we all get along really well. And when things get tough, you need each other to kind of, um, you know, pick pick each other up and keep working. And, yeah, I guess that's kind of what happened in that game. And In terms of driving the standards, um, is it leadership on the field? Does it come from the sideline? Who were the most prominent voices, both in a game situation where you need a comeback, but also in a training environment where, you know, it's a long season and you need to make sure people stay sharp and stay motivated? So who are the, who are the people that you feel as though are driving that at RPA this season? Yeah, I mean, you know, RP is a club that it's it's very lucky to have, um, you know, the kind of management that we do. Um, you know, we've got Brad Attard, who I've obviously worked with quite a bit. Um, and, you know, he's always that real positive reinforcement on that sideline. Like, he will give you everything until the 90th minute. Um, and then you've got the likes of, you know, Mateo as well with that never-say-die attitude that has just is just displayed across the whole club, like from the from the juniors at SAP level up into our first grade team, um, you know. So you've got those two that are like really driving that, and then we've also got um, Youngy, our captain. Um, you know, she's played at high levels, like you know, around the world. Played, um, I believe, under twenty threes, maybe England level. So she, you know, she's just such a great leader for for our girls, and the girls really respect her and. Um, you know, how she kind of, she, she shows in her, in the way she, that she plays her leadership, but also she's, you know, that real supportive voice as well when we need it. So, um, yeah, we're very lucky. It was a, a big a big decision for you when you moved to Apia, given that you were, you know, such a prominent player, you know, in the west of Sydney and both for the Wanderers, but also for Blacktown Spartans. And, you know, how have you found Apia? It sounds as though you're enjoying the environment. It clearly agrees with your football, given the performance level that you've had, but, you know, does it does it feel like it was the right move at the time? And you know, talk about what that decision has meant for your game. Yeah, I mean, I I loved my time at Blacktown. Um, it's a a real uh, you know family club, and obviously I've grown up in that area my whole life, so it kind of meant a lot to me um, in that aspect. Um, and yeah, I guess when I did decide to eventually move on. Um, to a club like Arpia that, you know, I'd kind of heard from Mateo for a couple of years before that and was never really ready to make, you know, that jump to another club. Um, But, yeah, I guess when I 
decided to make the move, I am, you know, I'm so glad that I did because I've, yeah, I feel like I've had probably the most two enjoyable seasons, um, you know, of my career so far with a club like RPR. It's just that real, like, you know, I haven't really been part of a club that's just, you know, from from the sap to the staff to the like to the people in the stands, like just. Yeah, it, it just it feels it feels like home, even though it's about you know forty five minutes from where I live. So <laughs> now you're no stranger to the Liberty A League. You've, you've played with uh, Canberra United, played with Western Sydney Wanderers, and you've had such an incredible season both last year and this year. Surely there's been a few phone calls. What can we expect? Is there any particular things we might want to know about? Um, and there's nothing that I know about just yet. So, um, yeah, unless you guys have heard anything different. Um, yeah, I haven't heard anything so far. So we'll, uh, we'll just have to wait and see. Now, notice Henley asked that question because um, <laughs> I, you know, if, if I knew something, I'd, I'd say, Ash. But uh, no, I, I, wanted to, I wanted to circle back to your goal scoring this year because the Golden Boot Race is pretty exciting. Amber Lookedmire is currently top at the time of recording, but Isabella Habuda is having a good season. Demi Kulazakis, uh, who we did speak to on this podcast earlier in the campaign, is still scoring goals. And there's a whole lot of players that are already in double figures that are only you know a hat trick or a good day out away from rejoining that Golden Boot race. Are you the sort of striker that needs to know how your rivals went? Do you come off and say, how many did Kulazaka score? How many did Amber score? Or do you, do, you, do you generally not worry too much about how many your rivals are on in that golden boot race? No, I don't worry too much about that. I, I think if I, yeah, I, I don't know how other people kind of go about that, but I think that would drive me a little bit crazy if that was all I was thinking about. And, you know, I just got to do what I'm doing. And, you know, I, I think if, if I tried to focus too much about that, I think it would really affect me. Um, you know, in my goal scoring. So I try and, yeah, try and just do what I've got to do. And then, yeah, I I actually wasn't really aware of it until a couple of weeks ago. So With with that said, you had a very different sort of attack last season. You had Rihanna Polisina, Holly McNamara was was playing on her comeback from injury. It's a a totally different cast of players that are sort of surrounding you in that attack this season. Has it changed the way you play? Has it changed sort of the role that you play within the team? Or is your sort of football and the way you score your goals still largely similar in spite of the player turnover? Um, I'd say it's pretty similar. I would say I've had to probably take up more of a, I guess, a leadership role this year. Just, you know, when you lose someone like like the likes of Mini, um, you know, that's a that's a big leadership role that kind of needs to be filled. So I, I am considered one of the older players in the team. So, um, I, yeah, I'd probably just say more, more of a leadership role for me this season. But in terms of, um, you know, the style of play and stuff like that, the girls are quite similar. Um, you know, you've got um, someone like Soph Hoban and Mona Walker as well that are playing in behind me. So, you know, the the skill levels, not, you know, not different at all. So, um, yeah, just kind of keep going the, the way we've been traveling before, but more of a leadership role for me this season. On the topic of leadership, you've got a few of the younger girls this year making the step up into first. We've got Mia Golding on the team. How important is it that we keep investing into this younger generation and this young talent, especially at Apia? Yeah, I mean, it's super important. Um, yeah, like I was saying, um, you know, I'm I'm at 26, I'm considered one of the old, older ones in the team, which, you know, when I was, um, you know, Mia and like Bryn's age, I was, you know, um, there was girls that, you know, were playing in their 30s and stuff. So I do feel like um, the competition is getting quite younger. So it is good to kind of bring those younger ones in and mentor them while we can. And then, you know, hopefully set up a, an RPR that's, Um, You know, when when my time comes and I, you know, move on, then, um, yeah, they'll still be in good stead to continue with the younger ones. And and I guess, you know, rather than uh, circle back to the the A-Leagues question, I'll ask you this instead. What's the ambition? Is it team success? Is it trophies? Is it just take it week by week? What is actually on your bucket list to tick off as a player in football? Because now that you've you've won a golden boot and uh, you've got your little piece of uh, history, you'll be on the honour roll as player of the year for the rest of you know your life which is a great thing to look back on so what's left what is the ambition at this point of your career yeah I mean you know I I just want to enjoy it I am you know getting older and you know 
eventually Tr- trust me you 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 are not getting older <laughs> 26 come on you're spending that. you're spending too much time around uh, 16 and 17 year olds if, I know. if you think you're getting older I yeah <laughs> need to stop listening to them um but yeah i mean i just want to enjoy it and you know i guess t- i guess taking that as far as i i i can i mean it's a, it's a tricky spot to be in um you know because i've uh, my my partner and i have bought a house and we're getting married next year so then that's also something that comes into it when you're considering um you know your your football and where that can kind of take you so um yeah i'm i'm just hoping to take it as far as it as i can allow myself to go so no, very well answered. Now, to finish, Henley's going to ask some rapid-fire questions. First thing that comes to mind, please, Ash. Henley, take it away. All righty. First up, we've got your first football memory. Um, winning the State Cup in under-12s. Day or night matches? Uh, day. Favourite footballer of all time? Um, Alessia Russo. Best football you've ever played with? Uh, Mini Policina. <laughs> Dream stadium to play in? Uh, the Emirates. And the go-to karaoke song? Sorry, what was that? The go-to karaoke song? Um, oh, I'm going to say uh, anything by Harry Styles. <laughs> Your biggest football ick? Uh, players that tuck their shirt in. And the MPL team you most want to defeat this season? Um, we're just happy to just keep going the way we're going. Um, and we're not, we're not going to pick anyone. So which of your teammates tuck their shirt in? Um, <laughs> Estelle, Estelle Fregali does sometimes, but I'm, I'm extra to let her know that that's not on. Calling her out there. Uh, la- yeah. Last one. Um, obviously as a, a, you know, serious football player at a high level, um, sleep rehab preparation is, is key. Are you going to be getting up at 3 a.m. to watch the Matildas in the Olympics or is it the sort of thing that's just too disruptive for the training and playing routine or will you be, <laughs> will you be making exceptions to watch them at 3 in the morning? Well, my, um, my go-to for games that are on in the middle of the night is I normally record them and get up at like 5 a.m. and then watch it before I go to work. So don't look at my phone, don't know the score, and I'll just get up a bit later and watch it recorded. Very disciplined <laughs> and very difficult to do in this day and age. Uh, Ashcroft, congratulations on the season so far. All the best to Arpia in the run to the finish line and your pursuit of a couple of trophies. And uh, with your own football, all the best for the remainder of the campaign as well. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. That was Ashcroft from Arpia Leichhardt. You're listening to Kick Off, the Football New South Wales podcast for NPL and New South Wales League competitions. MITRE is the official ball sponsor of NPL New South Wales and Football New South Wales League's competitions. Visit MITRE Sports Australia for all your football needs. MITRE, a different league. It's time to turn our focus to the Football New South Wales Leagues and the incredibly close title race in League One Women's. Mount Druitt Town are top. At the time of recording, only on goal difference. It's a really tight battle with the Southern District's Raiders and then Bankstown still in the conversation and Hills United, St George, maybe needing uh, a few slip-ups from the teams above them to rejoin that conversation. But at the top of the tree is Mount Druid Town and their captain and one of their star players is Emily Koss, who joins us. Em, thanks for jumping on kickoff. Thank you so much for having me. So at this point of the season, the home stretch is approaching. We know that Mount Druitt really showed their hand at the start of the season by recruiting Lena Karmas and yourself. Uh, it's a team full of gun players with A-League women's experience like Rosie Galea and Trudy Camilleri. But is the season meeting the expectations that you've set yourself to this point of the campaign? Um, I think we've actually exceed, exceeded um, expectations that were put on us at the beginning of the season. Uh, we definitely just wanted this to be like a building season, get to know each other. And we've built such an amazing team culture that it's really reflecting um, on the pitch. As you can see, we really fight for each other week in, week out. So it's it's really been an incredible season thus far. Now, at the preseason launch, you and I had a bit of a chat about the team and what the focus was for this year. And, you know, one of the things you actually brought up was that there's been plenty of new faces, not just on the pitch, but also off the pitch. So have a bit of a chat to us about the team. How have these new additions helped the club as you fight for that promotion? I think 
they have done really well in the recruitment. Ben's done an incredible job where he's looked at the player, but also what they're like as a person. So we've really built on that team culture within the team, with the players and also the staff. So from our managers to coaching staff, um, to the board as well, everyone is so close, which I think really reflects within the club environment and on the team too. It's a really lengthy commitment, the League One season. It's such a big league. It's so many games, you know, 26-game season. And you know, we're in the midwinter grind at the moment. How do you feel as though the team is handling that sort of demand? Because it's one thing for NPL One players or, you know, for A-League players to be in that high-stress, you know, you know, huge commitment environment. But at this level of the game, it's a lot of football for a very, you know, big chunk of the year. So how do you think your teammates and yourself are all holding up? I think we're doing quite well. Um, I was pretty unfortunate in pre-season to cop um, a pretty big injury. So I've only come back in the last like half of the season. So I missed the first half. But everyone's been doing well managing themselves on and off the pitch. So we've minimised injuries, um, touch wood. And I think also with training, they're managing our loads really well, especially since the season is such a long season, um, which has been really good. The quality of players playing in this competition is is pretty mind-boggling. I think about uh, six weeks ago, uh, your team played against Sutherland Strikers and they had, you know, Tori Tumeth and Lucy Johnson straight out of Sydney FC. They had a couple of other players who'd been top division NPL1 players join uh, the Sutherland Strikers. And ever since you beat them that day, they have won every single game. They've gone from rock bottom and flown up the table, which is pretty unexpected. Just how difficult is it week to week uh, in terms of the quality of the opponents you regularly find yourself facing? Oh, every week is extremely difficult especially with the caliber of play players that are playing in the league um you can't just ex go out and ex expect to win especially in this league um every game we have to take it game by game um definitely do our homework figure out how we're going to attack it um and especially with the caliber of players coming in after the a-league season as well it's made a, a significant impact on a lot of teams which has really um pushed this league to be a very competitive league as well now, on the topic of being competitive league, we're using title races all across the board um, this season. Last year in the League One as well, no different, another big title race. So what is it for you, what is the chats going on at training at the moment with the team? Is it full steam ahead to get the promotion and to lift the silverware? Yeah, definitely. Um, there's one of my favourite quotes that our coach uses and he always says that it's a privilege to feel pressure. And it's a privilege to feel that you're in that position. So I guess it's definitely a privilege to be in the position we're in, but we don't want to count our chickens too soon and just take it week by week. <laughs> now, I wanted to ask about your decision to go to Mount Druitt as well, because uh, summer before last, you were at Melbourne Victory. You were playing in the A-League women's and now you find yourself in, in League One. What are your ambitions for your football? Is it team success? Is it... You know, is there something that's driving and, and motivating you at the moment? Is it adventure? Is it different environments? Like, what, what is it that, you know, is currently motivating you? Um, so the reason I signed was definitely because um, our coach is there. So Ben, he is an incredible coach and he's also a, an amazing human. So coming back to Sydney, um, I was quite unsure where I was going to play. But after speaking with him, I was like, yeah, I definitely want to be under a coach that I know is going to bring the best out of me and my football. Um, definitely just focusing on team success um, and just building within myself as well and building on my performance and just that consistency as well, which has um, definitely been my goal for this season. Absolutely. Now, you also have played futsal quite a while with Drew Warriors and Phil's All-Stars. Chat to us. What is it that you find so appealing about the game? Um, I just love it. I love it so much and it just makes me so happy, like, Football is my happy point of like, if I've ever got too much going on in life, I know like going and seeing my teammates, being able to play um, is kind of like that escape. So it's definitely an honour to be able to keep playing, especially as I'm starting to get a little bit older. 
Well, uh, with, with that said, um, you know, you pro- I would argue that you are still in the prime years of your career rather than getting older. Um, <laughs> what, what is it, what sort of, do you feel any, you know, with the captain's armband and you've talked about the environment and the culture, what is it that you personally expect of yourself to be able to do to drive standards and drive culture within your team? Are there things you find yourself doing that previously you weren't doing as a younger player and are those things that, you know, are they behaviours that you're exhibiting from your previous leaders that you've had along the way? Yeah, I find myself being in sort of that leadership role of, like, taking the younger ones under my wing that don't necessarily have as much experience and trying to lead by example. So always trying to be that real positive mindset of, like, it's okay if you've made a mistake, just it's your actions that follow. Um, don't Don't dwell on the negatives. Um, and then just providing um, any experience that I have gone through in my career and being able to show younger ones that um, it's never too late, especially since like I made my debut in A-League um, quite old, that I want to show them that there's so many different pathways that you can take. Um, and if you're really determined, like you can definitely get there. Well, it's going to be a fascinating run to the finish line in League One Women's. Just like last season, we've got two teams that seem to be going goal for goal, point for point. I mean, you've almost got identical records, not just in terms of points, but goals for and against are also incredibly similar with uh, the Southern District's Raiders. So all we can do is wish you all the best and, uh, you know, at a a very, um, you know, uh, high tightrope with not too much room for error, uh, good luck for this home stretch as you try to close out the title and promotion. Thank you very much. Thank you to Emily Koss, our guest from Mount Druitt Town Rangers. So a big thank you to all our guests that have joined us on kickoff for this episode. Don't forget to subscribe. You can hear all the other guests and episodes we've recorded over the last two seasons. And while you're there, why not check out the Football New South Wales community podcast as well, where we keep you abreast of the issues that are facing the associations and the game broadly in this state. Henley, I've got a couple of these Australia Cup ties to look forward to in addition to the conclusion of both the Waratah and Sapphire Cups and NPL getting to the business end. It's, a, it's an exciting time. I mean, we're still probably in the midwinter grind for another month, but you know that when the weather starts to turn uh, in September, um, everyone's going to be feeling pretty good about those you know, climactic moments of the NPL season. Yeah, I mean, I'm super pumped for it. I'm, like, as I say, glad to be back to seeing, you know, this little relegation battle that's playing out between the boys. I think a lot of people sometimes... Uh, not overlook it perhaps you know they always look to the top of the table but I think the real interesting stuff is going to be happening down the bottom there I mean this it's a bit of a last minute thing to introduce but with the with everyone seemingly uh of the understanding that the second division nationally won't be going ahead as like a main league next year it might just be an additional competition on top of New South Wales I think people got clarity around relegation you know there was a lot of debate around are we going to leave our 23s behind are we going to leave five holes in the division that need to get promoted into i think we can we can park that for another year (laughs) i mean it's like you know as much as we all want it to go ahead at least we can park it for another year and people know where they stand and hopefully by the time we kick off at the start of next year everyone will actually know what the circumstances are rather than kind of a decision on the run when we get to the middle or the back end of next season. You want to know, you want to know when you commit your budget, when you know, you want to know how many teams are getting relegated. You want to know what your circumstances are before you go and build your squad. Absolutely. And I think it just brings the focus back to our competition and, you know, everyone's focused on that main goal, whether it be finals or the relegation, whatever it is. I think it's great. Everyone seems to be on track. So we'll just see how it goes. Henley, uh, thank you for joining me here on Kickoff. Thank you, Teo. Henley <laughs> Warner there. My name's Teo Pelizzeri. Don't forget to rate us five stars wherever you get your podcast. This has been Kickoff. We'll speak to you next time. And what a goal it was! Stewart makes it 1-1. And it is a gorgeous little chip. This could all be the moment. Yeah. It is the moment. 